Hi, everyone. I'm Amber Masso, the Director of Communications and Alumni Engagement for the Terry Foundation. I'm so excited for you to be joining us for another Terry in 30 chat today. I'm here with Lorenzo, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hello, everybody. My name is Lorenzo Washington. I was a 2014 Texas A&M Terry Scholar. I'm currently a third year PhD candidate student at UC Berkeley's Plant and Microbial Biology Department in Henrik Scheller's lab. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> so Lorenzo, thanks so much for taking the time to, to chat with me and to let me record our conversation today. Um, what's one thing you hope that uh, Terry scholars will be able to get from our discussion? So uh, I hope that they get maybe a little bit of insight into what navigating into the grad school space could potentially be like. And I also hope that um, in general, they just get a sense of, you know, some of the difficulties and strategies you can use to combat them when you are moving to a very different space or, or to, you know, very distant from where you've previously been used to living. Uh, yeah, and at the end of the day, I hope they just get a nice story and, and are really interested in science at some point, because I know I'm very interested in science, uh, and I hope that comes out, so. All right, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, me too. So you majored in bio, what was it, environmental science? Bioenvironmental sciences. It's really Bioenvironmental sciences and animal yeah. science though, right? Yes, ma'am. How did that lead to where what you're doing now in your graduate program? Yeah, so um, bioenvironmental sciences is kind of an interesting program. Uh, the name is like really fancy, but really it's just environmental sciences with more of a biological focus. So whenever we're talking about environmental things, as opposed to looking at it from strictly system standpoints, we would usually get really more into the nitty gritty of what's happening either at a molecular level or like talking about like plant pathology and things of that nature. Really, uh, it's kind of interesting because my majors are one thing, but really kind of me going into grad school came from what I was doing as a researcher in undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, I was always doing something involved with either uh, from plant pathology perspective or like plants and, and microbes and how they interact. Um, and I was always doing that research kind of not behind the scenes, but somewhat independent of my major, even though it was in the same department. And, and really when I sat with, mm. sat with it for a while, I realized that when I was in the lab space, I really wanted to be like the graduate researchers and the professors. I would do a bunch of work, right? And I would get all these results and then I would bring them to them and they would talk about what this means. I was just kind of like the, the info person, you know, I didn't really know what the information right. meant. I just produced it. Um, eventually I was like, wow, I really want to be able to talk about this stuff. Like they talk about it, you know, they're drawing all these conclusions from all these different places and just have such a breadth of knowledge. And eventually I was like, well, I guess grad school is the way to do it. Um, and I was lucky enough to, for things to go well my first application round. And that's how I ended up where I am. So how many, how many different programs did you look at or did you have just one in mind that you knew you wanted to shoot for? The three programs I applied to were UC Berkeley um, because really good program, really different space. Um, I had this inkling and I knew I wanted to get out of Texas, but I didn't know where. And then I had an inkling in the back of my head that I really wanted to go somewhere very different because like when I had gone to these very different spaces before through uh, study abroad, programs and whatnot, I really enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. So why I applied to Berkeley. I also applied to uh, University of Georgia at Athens. They had a really good program, somewhat similar to A&M. So I knew the environment would probably, I wouldn't need much adjustment, likely, um, and a really good program. Um, and I also applied to uh, North Carolina State. They have a really, um, really wide breadth of really talented uh, researchers working on plant sciences. Um, I was fortunate enough to get um, in interview solicitations from all of them, but because of how the uh, application, because of how the interview process went out, I had already visited both Berkeley and Georgia and enjoyed really well both of them um, mm -hmm. and figured those were probably my top two choices. Uh, so I declined my interview at North Carolina State um, and actually found out like 
four days after my interview at Berkeley that I was accepted. They're really quick here. Um, so that was kind of the end of it. And after that, I knew I was coming here. That's nice. You didn't have to wait too long and stress out over it. So during that whole process, what do you think was probably the, the most useful advice or the most impactful advice you received from somebody when you were trying to decide what to do or decide how you were going to make your decisions? For me personally, I think what was the most impactful was that, yes, I'm going there for school, but I'm spending my life, like five years of my life minimum, wherever I'm going to do this, whether I like it or not. So I needed to keep that in mind when looking. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really, I think that actually came down to it. I was really close between Georgia and Berkeley. Um, and that was still in the back of my head. And I realized I was like, well, if I'm going to spend five years somewhere. I should spend it somewhere that when I visited, I was like, wow, this is, seems like a really great and fun space to be. So when I'm really worried about my research or when I don't want to worry about my research, I can escape from it, come back, be recharged and keep going. Right. It makes it easier to invest in yourself when you're in an environment that feels like it can recharge you. I totally get that. Um, all right. So that's the decision you made. And for, it was your first time living outside of Texas, aside from studying abroad, right? Mm -hmm. So what was what has that transition been like for you over the last few years? It was way more intense than I expected it to be, honestly. Um, and I think that's just because in my other experiences living outside of Texas, even though they were only for like a month or a summer, um, even though I had, I guess it's probably just because I couldn't stay there long enough for it to settle in, but like I had that culture shock, but it was still just like, oh, this is, um, I still enjoy this space for what it is, even though it's very different. Um, but when I'm here, uh, I still, I very much enjoyed aspects of it, but at the same time, it was like, eventually I was like, dang, I can't put my finger on it, but like, it is a different space. You know, I have found really great friends and everything here, but like I left at that time, it was, you know, 22 years of my life, like my connections, my family, the people, the places I knew back in Texas, and that's gone. Like I can't access it here except through virtual space. Um, and, you know, when things got especially tough with like imposter syndrome and wondering, you know, whether or not I made the right decisions, you know, am I, you know, is this sufficiently different from what I was doing as an undergrad? Am I doing the right thing? Do, you know, all those really negative ideas um, in my head uh, it, it felt like much more intense because I was removed from my support network um, and I was still in the process of building my support network here. So I couldn't necessarily really share these things. Um, yeah, and I was like, uh, it, it was kind of like the, it really crept up on me. I think by November, I realized that something was really off um, and I really wanted to go home um, and I really needed to just talk about this transition. And that's actually why I sought out therapy, which was really great. Fortunately, mm -hmm. the grad students here, we have a pretty decent healthcare program and part of that is um, counseling services. Mm -hmm. So that's easy to do and that really helped me out a lot. Um, but yeah, I realized when I went home, I was like, oh yeah, I really <laughs> just needed to come back home for a bit and remember what it's like to be at home um, so I can go back there and, and try and make that space a little more like home for me too. Right. So do you feel like it was the, the academic setting that took the biggest adjustment or just transplanting yourself to, to a completely different state overall? It was honestly a double combo because I, the academic setting, it was like, I am in now in this academic setting where, you know, I'm a completely new figure. Like at A&M, I, for, you know, four years, I had been working to like establish connections and kind of have a name for myself amongst individuals on campus in various spaces. And so like, mm -hmm. able to go to I had places where I was known and in places where I was, you know, very comfortable in. But here it was like, I've stepped on campus, nobody really knows me except my cohort and the professors I've spoken to. Um, and then on top of that, you know, um, the educational environment is very different from undergrad. Um, I went from having to study for an exam to having to study for an oral presentation about a very niche topic, um, which like half the vocabulary I hadn't really become comfortable with yet. You know, it was just like a very big shift in what to expect from education. In my opinion, to a very positive space, I like this method of education much better. I think it's a it's the education, the type of education I liked a lot before I was kind of forced to adhere to this really what I think is just memorize it and then dump it or memorize right. it 
hope you need to use it soon um, kind of method. But like that was really intense just because it took up a lot more of my time and mental energy and I didn't, I had to relearn or, or, or learn newly all these things. And then on the other hand, you know, like I said, like, you know, I found some really great people off the bat, but still it's like I'm, <laughs> I'm having to make all these new friendships in like this, you know, several months span. Um, I'm having to get used to the people in my cohort. My, you know, my parents aren't here. My, my family isn't here. Um, all my, you know, really good friends I made are two hours behind. Um, mm -hmm. Even stuff like getting together for like video games or talking on the phone can be difficult. Um, so it was just kind of that double effect. It was like, I, you know, I'm trying really hard with classes and um, at the end of the day when I'm exhausted and if I want to just talk to somebody or, you know, do all that, I can't necessarily do it with the people I want to be doing it with. Mm. So. Just another tap in on your energy on top of all of that mental energy that you're trying to expand into with the, the new method of learning. Um, I think that it's great you were able to take advantage of the mental health resources that were offered to you as a graduate student. Um, that's one thing I've really appreciated um, in, the, in my time since college is seeing how, how much more people are talking about the importance of looking after your mental health and kind of destigmatizing this need to, to put a name to whatever it is that might be causing you problems and being okay with asking, asking for help. Um, it just, that was not a thing in, in my undergrad program and in the graduate program, uh, grad certificate program that I did as well. It was just sort of like, I don't know, it was like almost taboo. I think in my family too, we just did, that's not, that's not discussions we ever were comfortable having. So you also, if you come from a background like that, have to learn also, I think, how to advocate for yourself in that way. So I'm really proud of you for being able to, to identify that that was something that would help you and then actually reach for it and then be able to talk about it later. So it's, um, that's, a, that's a big step for a lot of people, just making, those, making all of those changes and making all those transitions anyway, and then realizing like, yeah, it's not a piece of cake. It's not gonna be a walk in the park. You, um, you've been there for a few years now. So how did you get into the specific research that you're doing right now? And what is that exactly? Yeah, so I honestly consider me getting into this research. I don't, I don't know, I'm still not quite onto the level of using like the term destiny, but I consider it extremely serendipitous mm. <laughs> that I'm researching what I'm researching. Um, Cause when I got here, all of my research I'd done before was more or less related to how plants interacted with microbial uh, entities like fungi, bacteria, et cetera, uh, viruses, um, both from a positive and negative standpoint. So both from like pathogens and getting sick and also from like how these can help the plant grow and produce food for us. So the way it works, we do like 10 weeks in a lab at a time in our first year doing work on top of classes and whatnot. Um, and the idea is we get a feel for what the what kind of work the lab is doing, techniques we might be using, what the lab environment is like, and we do this three times. And at the end of it, um, we sit down and have a you know have a talk with these professors about you know what that was like and if we want to join this lab or not. The talk is optional, of course. You can just email and be like, "Hell no," <laughs> if you want. <laughs> um, so like I had these confounding factors that that kind of influence my experience, but also at the end of the day, I. I I hadn't felt like I really found something I really wanted to look into that really uh, got at my mental, like I wanted it. And then our program is really flexible, fortunately. So I sent a few emails and talked about doing a fourth rotation. Um, and I was very blessed that my cohort um, was is a wonderful group of people. And after class one day, I was like, yo, I don't really know uh, where I want to go next. I don't really know what I want to do. And I, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, but I think I need some help. And so we sat down for like, I don't know, felt like a while, but might've just been like 10 minutes. And they basically just kind of like low key grilled me about what I wanted and what I came for grad school for. Um, and then we had a very open and honest conversation. We looked through different professors and we came up, um, they pulled up the professor I'm actually working for now, um, Henrik Scheller. And they were like, yo, you know, he mostly does, he was a uh, one of our teachers for one of our courses. Um, and he mostly does work in like cell wall stuff, which uh, is just kind of like structural analysis and whatnot, um, and some more basic biology questions. But he also had this um, side project in this graduate student that had recently finished um, and was staying there as a postdoc doing work on 
looking at how the cell wall and other aspects related to the cell wall were important for symbiotic relationships um, in the root system. So when I talk about symbiotic relationships, I'm talking about uh, microbes like fungi and bacteria that work together with plants um, to get them nutrients and resources they aren't able to get without them. Um, there's a lot of old nitty gritty details in that, but I'm kind of looking at both the bacterial and the fungal aspect um, and also other less uh, dramatic uh, symbiotic relationships, but the tying feature is um, the source of investigation is the cell wall and the plasma membrane itself. I'm looking at different components of that and how they might influence. These are ones that we already know about to some extent. We just don't know how they interact with this and how these different relationships might have um, crosstalk or like relationship between them um, at this level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what I'm looking into. Um, and at the time it was just like, oh, I'm just doing fungal stuff or I'm just doing this symbiotic thing. Um, but that was really interesting mm -hmm. to me because the only thing, or I kept remembering my freshman year learning about um, one of the symbiotic relationships I research are buscular mycorrhizal fungi in class. And I'd never learned this about plants before. And I remember when I learned it, I was like, wow, that's really cool. I've never heard anything that wild before. I didn't even know plants could do stuff like this. That's amazing. Awesome. And then I never touched it again in undergrad and uh -huh. <laughs> grad school. And it's like, oh my God, here it is again. And I get a chance to like really grapple with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hopped on and after a few weeks in lab, I was like, I really want to work on this. I like this lab space. Um, I liked the professor. I like this people in the lab and um, yeah, they let me join. And I, that's what I work on now. And I, I've hopped on a few other projects that are or rather the professor has expanded the work he's doing in this field. And so I'm helping other researchers um, kind of do things that are really closely related to mine, but in a, like with different tools. And I've also hopped on um, these larger collaborative projects where I'm doing something uh, that helps the bigger picture that's going on with researchers like in Europe and, and whatnot, so. That's really cool that you had kind of those twin aha moments just at different times and how you were able to finally capitalize on that. So what are some um, future applications or implications of this work that you're helping research right now? Yeah, so the when we're looking at like plant microbial relationships, historically, we've only really looked at that in the context of how are these hurting the plant and how are these preventing us from getting the crops or the resources we want to get from this this plant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only in the context of disease. And that's mm -hmm. understandable. Um, and that's really important work. But with new tools and new technologies, we've realized that there are these micro, or we've come to a much greater understanding of how certain microbes are, or rather this other um, area of microbes that are really, really important for keeping plants healthy that we've kind of neglected when it comes to breeding and science for the last you know, super long time. Um, and when you think about it from that perspective, it's like, well, instead of looking to the microbes to help us in this case, we've decided to do that ourselves when it, with stuff like pesticides, herbicides, and other things, which as we've clearly demonstrated are not sustainable to use in agriculture at this point. Um, the way we use them is harmful to the environment. It is not sustainable because, you know, every advancement is only an advancement for a few years and then the microbes get over it and it's a problem again. And it's this constant rat race. Um, and so, you know, when you look at, okay, microbes can do all this bad, but they can do a lot of good. So the more we learn about this good, mm -hmm. the more we learn about how this good is done, the more we learn mm -hmm. about, you know, the systems that are involved in this and what they're doing, um, we can really then turn around and use it through breeding, through synthetic biology and like really innovative application. We can start to, um, do what I like to call like the really sci-fi stuff. We can have like, yeah, you know, farmers that are talking about, yeah, I put this fungus in the soil and these bacteria in the soil and I only have to apply fertilizer once a year. Um, and I have way less issues with pests and, and, and whatnot. And that's very downstream application. I'm doing the more fundamental work of, of really understanding the nitty gritty of what's going on at the cellular level between these things. So we have the knowledge we need to do, or rather I'm adding to the knowledge that we need to have to be able to take it to that applied, really sci-fi-like level 
um, where we can talk about having, you know, we're growing all these crops in the fields thanks to, you know, their help from fungi and bacteria. Um, some stuff you might see in like, you know, like a Star Wars, Star Wars or like a Star Trek kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, look what they're growing out there. Uh -huh. It's crazy that like, we'll talk about stuff now, like it's sci-fi when it's like using things that already exist in na like naturally occur in nature. <laughs> exactly. um, and then a few years, it won't even be sci-fi. It'll just be like, well, yeah, that's the way, that's the way it is. We just, just weren't aware of it at the time <laughs> or we, we weren't willing to be aware of it in most cases. <laughs> that's really yeah. cool. The um, uh, kind of a fun thing is uh, one of the things I study the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, James in, in the av avatar, the like the blue alien avatar, mm -hmm. uh, whole like neural network in the planet, how everything connects, mm -hmm. um, actually inspired by AMF. Um, and people often use very similar descriptions that people would use in avatar to describe that system of like, it's this huge network of, of you know, fungal, or this huge fungal network that these plants can tap into for stuff. And it's just like this really interesting how actual science inspires science fiction and science fiction in turn inspires actual science kind of thing. I just love really, stuff. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff is super cool. So, um, and it's obvious that you really enjoy talking about your research and that you're, you know, you're super passionate about it. How, um, how has that translated into other things you've been able to do while at Berkeley and while living in California? So one of the, I guess, like biggest things I've done since I've got here, actually I did like as soon as I got here was I got really involved in a lot of outreach stuff. And when I say outreach, it's like specifically talking about um, like STEM communication and literacy outreach. So I've been, um, I'm involved with an organization called CLEAR. It's this really long acronym that talks about like science literacy and agriculture and research. But uh, we pre-COVID would do stuff like going to the farmer's market and having, um, ask a scientist things where we would, we would have like a sort of a pre-planned demonstration to help like, you know, interact with children or whatnot. But really it's just like, you got any questions about science? Come talk to us. We got a plant biologist here. We got a microbiologist here. We got somebody that studies meteorology. Like, you know, you just, you want questions, we can try and ask them um, to the best of our ability. Uh, and really the whole thing about that is like, or at least clear is we want to break down this public science barrier, right? And we want scientists seem to other people seem like the people we actually are we're just a bunch of nerds <laughs> talking about this stuff uh, and so like that's one thing I've been involved in I've also been involved with a lot of fortunately here at Berkeley there's a lot of already already institutionalized sort of pipeline systems for outreach mm -hmm. to public uh, schools in the area and help like as as grad students um, and postdocs and professors we help students work on middle school science projects while they're in school or we'll go and teach, uh, you know, hour long lesson about plant adaptation to a bunch of uh, second graders um, somewhere in Oakland or Richmond or something like that. Um, and I hopped on that stuff immediately because I, 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 like you just said, I love talking about this stuff. Um, when I was young, I grew up in a space where I was extremely passionate about these things. And I was fortunate enough to have the space to be passionate about it, but I never saw anyone like me that was also passionate about it. So as a kid, it was like, you know, the only people that look like me are, you know, in entertainment, in sports, or much worse when it comes to yeah. media representation. Um, and so from my perspective, I, you know, as soon as I got here, and it's like, well, there's all these opportunities, I wanted to make them if they weren't here. So, you know, I, I really just want to be that face that I didn't get to see um, when I was a passionate little kid about science, you know, I, I want to walk into a classroom or be talking about this thing and for a kid to be like, oh, I can do this. Um, I'm really excited about this, so are they. They're there, I can be there too. Um, and that's just like, hopefully I make that connection here and there. Um, but I also just love to talk about this stuff. Um, so that's a lot of the outreach stuff I've done um, in sort of manifesting, I guess, the other stuff outside Berkeley. I've also gotten much more I feel like I've gotten much more like politically and like as a quote unquote, as like as a proper citizen involved um, when it comes to politics. The spirit behind that here is a lot, I feel like a lot more intentional than it was in Texas. Voting is a lot more, um, it's a lot easier. There's a lot more information given to us off the bat. Um, we have a lot more, from my perspective, it feels like we have a lot more impetus to actually do this with like 
well-informed intention when we come to vote as opposed to like just show up on election day and vote for whatever you feel like. Um, and that's translated in like more activity in, um, you know, things like protests and organizing, um, union involvement and whatnot. Um, and so I've become more involved with that as well. I think that's just the spirit of Berkeley or at least the spirit of Berkeley students. I'm not gonna say the administration is like that because we know how that tends to go. Um, I've also got really involved with that uh, in terms of like, I guess, concrete involvements that aren't grad school. Um, you know, somewhere along the way, it happened where you weren't just the person who was gathering the data, like you're a person who has the answers now. So <laughs> in terms of uh, in terms of being in the lab and then also being able to turn around and teach in the classroom and then even the example you're setting for people. So did you have a moment where you were just like, hey, when did this shift happen? Or have you had that moment yet? I mean, it seems like you might have, but. Yeah, it was it came honestly kind of late. Um, I've actually talked about this in the course I'm taking. It's this like anti-racist actions in environmental sciences. Um, but I was talking about how it took until this year for me to be like, oh, I'm a scientist. Like I have the authority to say I'm a scientist now and I, I do scientific work. I can talk with some level of authority on, on several scientific topics. Um, and like when I go do these things, I'm what some people might call an expert um, when it comes to like credentials on this stuff. Uh, and it was, I don't really know how to describe the feeling I got when I felt that. It was this really interesting mix of like, holy shit, <laughs> um, like I'm here. Um, well, like at least I'm at the start of here. Um, and also this combination of like, why did it take so long? I'm, I'm not really doing much different stuff than I used to do. I just learned how to talk about it and do it a little better. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like that really happened this year. And I think the catalyst for that was last year in the fall was when I taught biology. And when I say that was a great experience, like I was like, one of my students wrote me a thank you letter and it literally brought me to tears um, because they, it was just, I had really engaged students. They were really excited to come to class. It was a very difficult course. Biology is one of those intro weed out type things, which I hate, mm. I tried to make it as less the experience of that as possible and um it really came through to several of the students um and from my perspective it was the first time i think i've taken a course or been a part of a course and i was like we're well, not the first time but the first time i took an undergrad course and been a part of an undergrad course and i was like oh wow this is really exciting and interesting stuff and i really want to convey this to other people mm. um because i have the like instead of learning it for the first time i have all this other knowledge going around right um and that really helped me be like, oh, I'm not necessarily just the learner anymore. I'm, I'm a producer, I'm a disseminator, you know, I'm more concretely part of this education cycle that happens. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I had all this anxiety leading up to the quals exam and I passed the quals exam. And so it's like, I, you know, my email tag says PhD candidate instead of PhD <laughs> student. And it's like, that's fulfilling in of itself. Um, you know, I've, I've filed the paperwork I, for candidacy. And, you know, now it's like, I'm in this position where, you know, instead of just sitting there learning in the lab, it's like, I, I'm expected to kind of produce a little more. And it's like, that's scary. But then also I think about it and it's like, but I know how to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I sat down and I was like, well, I, I can teach. I know I can teach very well because the students liked it. I got an award for it. You know, people like validated that. And then I can show that I can think about my research really well. I, four professors thought with glowing reviews that I, could do it. My PI was really happy with what I put out, you know, and now I'm doing outreach stuff and teachers are calling me the scientist and students are asking me how to be a scientist. And I'm writing a paper about, or I'm writing an article about AMF for a local nature magazine. Um, and in the email, she's talking about wanting the expert perspective. And it's like, there's all these things that are like, you, like, you're, you've made it, you're doing what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't really ignore that anymore. And it was just like, that's very nice <laughs> to <Yeah>. have information <laughs> outwardly. I, it's kind of unfortunate it took so many outward confirmations for me to internalize it, but um, I'm very happy that 2020 has been a whole lot, <laughs> but at the very <laughs> least out of it, I got what I consider is my final step in maturation to this stage of my life of being like, I am a scientist, science is what I'm doing, so. That's awesome. 
Well, congratulations for all of that. I think that the um, the weight for that alignment between the external like external validation and that internal validation we allow ourselves to have um, sometimes can feel like it's a bit more protracted than it needs to be. But um, I'm so glad that those things finally started aligning for you. And I think an important message for people to remember is like, it's okay if that takes a while and it's okay if that isn't something that's happening very quickly because um, it looks it looks different for everybody. Um, I, I often wonder when I'm going to have that sort of epiphany about just being an adult in general. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. it feels so like sometimes it's way easier to wake up and acknowledge you can be an expert in something, but then you look at something you have to do just to like keep yourself alive on a daily basis. And you're like, who decided that I was ready to do this? <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Oh, I feel that one. Um, but I love I love being able to hear that the alignment of the things that you're passionate about and the things that you have such hard earned knowledge of through your work in academics are finally starting, you know, they're really starting to gel for you. Um, for anybody who's having those moments, I think those feelings of imposter syndrome and those moments of doubt, um, what advice would you give them um, when they're in that headspace? First, you're not alone, like 100% you're not alone. Um, literally almost everybody, even professors as they, like the professor of your class, as they are now to some extent, probably have feelings of this. Like this is a common, like it, it's just a human thing to think that we're not, we don't have this. And also the way that the structures of education and of you know whatever process you're going through to, to get that corporate or whatever, they're not really, in my opinion, set up to really give us any sort of affirming sense that we're supposed to belong there. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of things wrong in, in terms of that nature. So you're not alone. Um, like, you know, I think our cohort regularly bonded over, wow, none of us know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we all got to Berkeley and here we are like, oh shit, <laughs> why, why are we here, you know? Um, so it's like, yeah, you're not alone. And then also, um, for me at least, what really helped was therapy. And if if that is an avenue that is available to you, seeking that professional outside help, um, I acknowledge that not everyone has that ability. But if you do, I strongly suggest that you at least attempt uh, it and see if it can work for you. For me, it was extremely instrumental in getting over, you know, a lot of these really big humps in my way of getting that sense that I do actually belong here, um, mm -hmm. both as myself and as a, my professional self. Um, and then finally, it's just this acknowledgement. I guess I want to acknowledge that like that feeling never really doesn't necessarily go away. Like even though I, I have this sense that I, you know, I am a scientist, I am a teacher, I am a researcher. I still regularly have anxiety over like, oh, dang, I don't really know what I'm doing this week, or I'm not doing well enough here, or is this enough, is whatever. All these, all these negative thoughts keep swirling around. And for me, what's been really important in combating that is taking a deep breath, <laughs> letting that breath go, taking another deep breath, and then being like, if I ever doubt what I'm doing, I just have to think back to all the stuff I've done before. And it's like, I did all of that. So I know I can do this. You know, I got here and that just be, simply the act of me getting here was not easy. And so I know that I can do the rest of it. Um, and it's just that step of like reaffirming yourself that you are capable because you have proved that you are capable really has helped me. Um, and I know it's helped some other people, at least in my immediate vicinity um, in regards to this, the like imposter syndrome and feelings of not belonging and not like that we're not good enough for what we're doing. I think you make an excellent point about that never really truly going away like it might evolve over time or the way that you recognize it might evolve over time and I think it's important for people to acknowledge that it's okay if it doesn't go away it doesn't mean that you haven't like there isn't some code that you're supposed to have cracked already there's not some solution that you have that you just haven't found yet um one of the big things for me uh that's been helpful during the pandemic has actually been meditating and it took me a long mm -hmm. time to um, really grasp the concept of equanimity, where it's the point of meditating is not that you're supposed to just completely clear your head. And if you haven't done that, then you're not meditating correctly because our brains are not made to just turn themselves off. 
And so it's the ability of being able to recognize, hey, I'm drifting, acknowledging that for what it is, and then allowing it to like run its course and get yourself back on track, not fight the fact that it's happening or beat yourself up over the fact that you allowed it to happen or that your mind isn't quiet enough. Um, so I think whenever we're facing these individual challenges, that idea of equanimity probably can be really helpful as well. Just saying it's okay if a challenge does pop up or it's okay if I'm still struggling with something I thought I was over already. Um, it's all right if things turn into a little bit of a cycle, it's recognizing that it's still there and celebrating our ability to acknowledge it and then also acknowledge that we previously were able to do something about it, so. A beautiful. A beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really appreciate you sharing your perspectives, you sharing your like your experiences in, in your challenges and then also just, you know, the journey that you've taken and the journey that you're still on. Um, I am super proud of you for using your voice in all of the ways that you've chosen to give it power, whether it's through your perspectives as a student, whether it's through your activism, whether it's reaching behind you and, and helping kids see themselves in the space that you exist in and realize it can be accessible to them too. I think all of those things are so important. And um, it's why Mr. Terry chose to invest in people. Um, so that we could continue to make sure that there, there are opportunities for those that come behind us. So thank you for everything you're doing. Um, thank you for being so passionate about everything that you do. And we're just super excited to see as things continue for you. Thank you so much.